The ancestors of Martin Luther were called Luder. They lived near the little village of Myra in the Thuringian Mountains, about 120 miles southwest of modern Berlin. They were sturdy, honest, hard-working peasants. I am the son of a peasant. My father, my grandfather, and all my ancestors were genuine peasants. Afterwards, my father turned out to be a miner. Despite his humble origins, Martin's father, Hans Luder, married Margaretha Lindemann, daughter of a middle-class family from Eisenach. The Lindemann family tradition included education. Hans and Margaretha Luder moved to the little town of Eisleben, where on November 10, 1483, a son was born to them. He was baptized on the following day, receiving the name of the saint of that day, Martinus. Soon after Martin's birth, Hans Luder moved his family to Mansfeld to improve their financial condition. There he found work in the mines. In this quaint old town, perched on the side of a steep mountain, Martin Luther was reared in poverty and hardship. Martin had three younger brothers and three younger sisters. They lived here. However, only one brother and the three sisters survived to adulthood. My father was a poor miner and my mother carried the wood from the forest on her back. They both worked their flesh off their bones in order to bring up their children. The home was typical of the times. His parents were harsh disciplinarians. They ruled with the rod. My mother once beat me up with a cane for stealing a nut until the blood came. Such strict discipline drove me to the monastery, although she meant well. My father once flogged me so cruelly that I fled away from him and came to bear a grudge against him. It was a long time until he again won my confidence. Yet Luther was deeply devoted to his parents, always seeking their approval. In Mansfeld, with the help of his wife's relatives, Hans quickly climbed to the ownership and part ownership of several mines and smelters. By 1491, he was highly respected in Mansfeld, and invited to the castle, become a member of the city council. Martin Luther's family attended this parish church in Mansfeld. His training was marked by deep-rooted piety. His mother shared the common and crude superstitions of the time. When one of her sons died, she blamed a neighbor, certain that she was a witch. And Hans had joined in seeking a special indulgence for his parish church. His parents desired to bring up their children in the fear of the Lord. It was fear indeed that was implanted into the young mind of Martin Luther. Popular religion of his day was by no means a source of joy and happiness. It presented Christ not as a friend of sinners, but the frightening avenger. From early childhood, I was accustomed to turn pale and tremble whenever I heard the name of Christ even mentioned. For I was taught to look upon him as a stern and wrathful judge. We were taught that we ourselves had to atone for our sins. And since we could not make sufficient amends or do acceptable works, our teachers directed us to the saints in heaven and made us call upon Mary, the mother of Christ, and implore her to avert from us Christ's wrath and make him inclined to be merciful to us. He also prayed to St. Anna, the mother of the Virgin, and to St. George, a special patron saint of the city of Mansfeld. When Martin was five years old, he was sent to the Latin school in Mansfeld, where barbaric teaching methods of the Middle Ages still reigned. With help from his rod, the schoolmaster hammered into the young minds 
the Ten Commandments, the Lord's Prayer, the Apostles' Creed, reading, writing, and Latin grammar. In 1497, at age 14, Luther left Mansfeld for boarding school at Magdeburg. A year later, his father sent Martin to Eisenach, which was closer to home. Also, Father Hans hoped relatives of his wife who lived there would take interest in Martin. They did not. At school, Martin had to sing and beg for his daily bread, just as he had done in Magdeburg. Embarrassed and discouraged, he often thought of returning home to Mansfeld and becoming a miner like his father. Frau Kota, the wife of a wealthy merchant in Eisenach, noticed Martin's strong voice singing in church and in her courtyard. She took a liking to him and offered him a place at her table and in her family, at this stately old house facing the marketplace in Eisenach. Martin loved music and did well playing the lute. By now, Hans Lude began to have ambitious plans for his son. Martin would study law. As a lawyer, Martin would have a secure future. He would be able to provide for himself, his siblings, and his parents. By now, the financial condition of Hans Luder was materially improving, owing to his industry and thrift. He had moved to a new house. He was now in a position to support his son's education. Hans decided to send Martin to study law at Erfurt. In the summer of 1501, at the age of 18, Martin Lude ex Mansfeld entered the University of Erfurt. Founded a hundred years earlier in 1392, it was then one of the most prestigious in Germany. Here Luther lived and studied logic, dialectics, rhetoric, and philosophy. Martin's talents were evident. Soon they were calling him the philosopher. At the university library, he saw the complete Latin Bible. Martin had never seen a Bible. He was astonished to find many more texts than were contained in the prayer books or read in the churches. From then on, he longed to have his own Bible and prayed that God would provide it for him. In 1502, he received Bachelor of Philosophy, and in 1505, Master Degree, second in a class of 17 candidates. He was now ready to enter his law studies with every expectation to a distinguished and prosperous career. During his years in Erfurt, as a fledgling law student, Martin began to have doubts about the status of his soul. Then on 2nd July, 1505, when returning to the university after a brief holiday with his parents, he was caught in a terrible storm just outside Erfurt. Lightning struck near him. Terrified, he threw himself on the ground and cried out, Holy Anna, help me, help me, and I will become a monk. He was spared, but he had made a vow. It had to be carried out. It was hard. The greater the sacrifice, more meritorious the obedience. The violent storm radically changed the future for Martin Luther. On July 16, 1505, fellow students gathered in Martin Luther's room at Erfurt. Then Luther startled his friends. Today you will see me for the last time, for tomorrow I shall become a monk. Peals of laughter greeted this announcement. It was a good joke. When Luther insisted it was no joke, his friends implored him to change his mind. He did not. 
The next day, he gave away all his possessions, then asked his friends to escort him to the cloister of the observant Augustinians. As the heavy cloister doors closed behind him, Martin Luther said goodbye to the world. When he heard about this, Hans Luther was beside himself. All his hopes were shattered. All the sacrifices he and his wife made for so many years were wasted. A man of good common sense and accustomed to hard work, Hans had not much use for what he considered ignorant and lazy friars and monks. When Martin insisted that he was following a divine command, his father indignantly replied, God forbid that you are misled by a devilish deception. Did you never read that a son is to honor his father and mother? Luther's Augustinian order demanded rigorous obedience and fervent devotion to the Virgin Mary. He assumed the most menial offices to subdue his pride, begged in the streets, and submitted without a murmur to the severe demands of monastic life. For each of the seven appointed hours of prayer, Martin would recite the Lord's Prayer 25 times, along with the Ave Maria. Martin regularly confessed his sins to the priest at least once a week. Luther's prayer for a Bible was answered when his superior, Johann von Staupitz put a complete Latin Bible in Martin's hands. At the end of his probationary year, Martin fell upon his knees and vowed, I, Frater Martinus, confess and pledge obedience to God Almighty and to the Holy Virgin Mary, to the prior of this monastery and to the general order of St. Augustine, to live without property, in chastity, and in obedience to the rules of St. Augustine, as long as I live. Martin Luther prostrated himself on the floor in the form of a cross, while the assembly chanted prayers of consecration. And when he arose, he was a monk. Luther was a sincere, earnest, and conscientious monk. His main motive was concern for his salvation. Who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate. Here, he observed every detail of discipline. No one surpassed him in prayer, fasting, night watches, and self-mortification. He did not simply engage in these practices. He pursued them to the point of exhaustion. No wonder he was already held up as a model of sanctity. He would later write, If ever a monk got to heaven by monkery, I would have gotten there. But he found no peace and rest in his soul. The scriptures impressed upon him the terrors of divine justice. His sin weighed heavily upon him. It was crushing him. No one particular sin, but a sinful nature that pervaded his entire being, brought him to the brink of despair. The inner pain intensified as Martin Luther approached the ceremony of his ordination. At 23, the second year of monastic life, Luther was ordained to the priesthood. On 2nd May, 1507, he said his first Mass. He was so overwhelmed by the solemnity of the offering that he nearly fainted at the altar. His father Hans came to the Mass and gave a gift of money, even though he could not accept Martin's monasticism, and the two remained basically unreconciled. Luther continued a devoted monk, 
He read Mass every morning. Every week he invoked 21 saints as his helpers, three every day. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Elector Frederick the Wise, ruler of Saxony, wanted his own university. In 1502, he founded the University of Wittenberg. It was a town of 400 low, straw-thatched houses with under 3,000 poor and unlettered people. Who would have guessed that before long, Wittenberg had become one of the most renowned seats of learning in Europe? It was here that Martin Luther would spend most of his life and do most of his work. Because the income of the new university was small, Frederick the Wise used priests from the two local churches as professors at the university. He also expected that the Augustinian monastery in Wittenberg would furnish a number of teachers. He appointed vicar general of the monastery, Dr. Staupitz, dean of the theological faculty. As early as 1508, Frederick the Wise invited Luther to Wittenberg to teach moral philosophy. Even though now a professor, Luther still struggled in his soul. Nothing he did made him feel he could stand before God. He read in Romans 1.17, the righteous shall live by faith. He knew he was not righteous. I hated that word, the righteousness of God by which I had been taught according to the custom and use of all teachers, that God is righteous and punishes the unrighteous sinner. But Luther would not quit. He kept going to confess to Staupitz. Luther exhausted Staupitz with his frequent confessions. Man, God is not angry with you. You are angry with God. Don't you know that God commands you to hope? Then a turning point came one day in 1511, while Luther and Staupitz were sitting under a tree in a garden near the Augustinian monastery. Staupitz suggested, Martinus, you should work for your doctorate. Luther objected. Strength would fail me. It will be the death of me. Staupitz had a witty response. Quite all right. Do you not know that God has plenty of work for wise and clever men like you to do in heaven? If you should die, you will be his advisor. Thus, against his will, the bright young Luther was encouraged to become a doctor of theology. I was compelled to become a doctor without any initiative of my own, but out of pure obedience. Most scholars in those days did not complete their doctorate until the age of 40 or older. Luther received this honor at the age of 28 on 18th October 1512. What I began as a doctor, I must truly confess to the end of my life. I cannot keep silent or cease to teach. Luther now taught theology at the Wittenberg University, Lucoria. But by theology, he meant the theology of the Bible and preferred to be called Doctor of Holy Scriptures instead of Doctor of Theology. It was during this period of 1515 to 1519 that Luther's understanding of God was radically shaken, mostly through his intensive study of the New Testament Book of Romans. He discovered that the Bible spoke of the grace of God as a free gift and not through the sacraments or good works. As I meditated day and night on the words, as it is written, the righteous person shall live by faith, I began to understand that the righteous person lives by the gift of a passive righteousness, by which the merciful God justifies us by faith. 
This immediately made me feel as though I had been born again and as though I had entered through open gates into paradise itself. God accepts Christ's righteousness, which is alien to our nature, as our own. Though God does not actually remove our sins, we are at the same time righteous and sinful. He no longer counts our sins against us. And now, where I had once hated the phrase, the righteousness of God, I began to love and extol it as the sweetest of phrases, so that this passage in Paul became the very gate of paradise to me. By the year 1514, in addition to being a professor at the University of Wittenberg, Luther also assumed the priesthood at the city church. Soon, Luther observed that many people in Wittenberg were not coming to the church for confession of their sins anymore. Instead, they were going to buy indulgences. According to the Catholic Catechism, Indulgences are documents prepared by the church and received by individuals, either for themselves or on behalf of the dead, and serve as payment on the debt which the sinner owes to God. Through its priests, the church offers forgiveness and absolution, but only the guilt and the eternal punishment are forgiven, and there still remains the temporal punishment to be borne by the sinner. This temporal punishment can be reduced by performing pilgrimages, prayers, and other deeds of penance prescribed by the church. Since these deeds cannot be discharged fully in this life, the soul after death must pass through a cleansing process in purgatory. Because the church holds the treasure of the merits of all the saints, the church could reduce or even remit altogether this punishment through indulgences. These indulgences can be obtained not only for the living, but also for the dead would be released from purgatory after a certain period. Though seldom offered, it is also possible to obtain a plenary or total indulgence that would release a person from purgatory altogether. This release from purgatory was on sale by Pope Leo X also called Giovanni dei Medici. Appointed a cardinal at the age of 13, the son of the Medici family ascended the papal throne at age 38. He spent freely and soon was in financial trouble. To raise funds, 2,000 church offices, including those of bishops and cardinals, were offered for sale. In addition, the sale of indulgences provided Pope Leo another source of income. He issued an indulgence for special sale in Germany, where Archbishop Albrecht of Brandenburg was deep in debt after he purchased multiple offices from the Pope. So a partnership for sale of indulgences was forged between the Pope and the Fuggers, the rich bankers of Augsburg for collection of money. The Dominican Johann Tetzel promoted the indulgences. Forgiveness for any and every sin, either actually committed or only contemplated, could be purchased. The souls of the departed ones could be redeemed immediately. The popular jingle went, as soon as the coin in the coffer rings, the soul from purgatory springs. Tetzel was good at his job and described in the most dreadful colors the torments of purgatory. He played upon the sympathy, the noble sentiments, and the fears of simple hearers. Listen to the voices of your dear dead relatives and friends, beseeching you and saying, pity us. Pity us! We are in dire torment from which you can redeem us for repentance. 
Luther was indignant. He knew by now that forgiveness could not come through human effort, and he was equally sure it could not be bought. After reading an instruction manual for indulgence traders, Luther attacked the indulgence trade by letter to his superiors from the pulpit, and he called for scholarly debate on the matter by drafting the 95 arguments or theses. When on the 31st day of October, 1517, Martin Luther posted his theses to the castle church in Wittenberg, he had no preconceived plans. He saw a great moral and religious wrong, and he rose to fight. As was common practice in such scholarly documents, by writing in Latin, Ordinarily, such an invitation to academic debate was no big deal. But this time it was different. Luther unintentionally lit a powder keg. Petrius Johannes of Nuremberg published translations of the theses into the common language and spread the message across Germany. Within two weeks, Tetzel's cash receipts fell off perceptibly. He was infuriated. He thundered against Luther. Backed by the power of the Pope, Tetzel sent a box of counter-theses to Wittenberg. Soon it was feared that the insolent monk, Martin Luther, would soon be burned just as only about 20 years earlier, Savonarola in Italy had been punished for his preaching. Undaunted, Luther displayed a similar audacity when he preached his Sermon on the Church. Though by excommunication, a Christian can be separated from the visible church, but not from the communion of the true church of God and of his saints. When Pope Leo first heard of Luther's 95 theses, he did not take it too seriously. He brushed them off with the comment. Oh, some drunken German has written them. As soon as he is sober again, he will speak differently. But the drunken German had not become sober. Pope Leo began to see that action was needed. In the beginning of August, he summoned Luther to Rome within 60 days to answer the charge of heresy. Luther knew to go to Rome would mean death, so he petitioned the elector Frederick the Wise to request that the trial be held in Germany. George Spalatin, the confidential secretary of Elector the Wise, was a close friend of Luther's. Spalatin had strong influence with Frederick, and that secured Frederick's protection for Luther even though he never met Luther personally. Through Frederick's effort, Luther was granted a hearing before the papal legate at Augsburg, which ironically took place in the same bank as indulgences. However, Luther was warned from many places in Germany to stay away from Augsburg, as plots were being hatched to ambush and kill him on his way, or poison him if he made it to Augsburg. The papal legate, Cardinal Cahayton, had received special instructions from the Pope. If Martin Luther does not recant, arrest the son of wickedness and his followers and send them to Rome under strong guard. Everyone who should dare to house or shield or in any way, either openly or privately, protect or assist or counsel Martin Luther should be severely punished. Martin Luther obeyed the command of the head of the church. He proceeded to Augsburg. Now I must die. Oh, the disgrace that I heap upon my poor parents. As he neared the city, his faith was less shaken. I am firm. The Lord's will be done. Even in Augsburg, in the midst of his enemies, Christ reigns. May Christ live and Martinus die. On October 12th, in Augsburg, Luther met the papal legate Cardinal Cahayton who presented three demands from the Pope. In the first place, you should revoke your errors. 
Secondly, you should promise never to teach them again. And thirdly, you are in the future to refrain from anything that might disturb the peace of the church. When asked to show him specific errors, Cahayton singled out two theses. When Luther began to discuss them, the cardinal impatiently cut him off. Revoke! Go away! Revoke or do not come again before my eyes! In the dead of night, a small gate in the city wall was open for Luther to escape. On October 31st, exactly one year after the posting of the theses at the castle church, Luther returned safely to Wittenberg. Verhaeten demanded from the elector Frederick the Wise that Luther be sent prisoner to Rome, or at least banished from his home country. But Frederick refused. He insisted on a fair trial before impartial judges. Luther prepared for the worst by appealing to a general council of the Holy Roman Empire. Luther and everyone else feared his excommunication, but Rome hesitated. The agitation in Germany was too wide to allow for summary proceedings. It was decided to make one more attempt to silence the German beast, this time in a different way. The fame of Wittenberg University now attracted hundreds of students and scholars from all parts of Germany. Dr. Luther, of course, was the greatest drawing card. In 1518, Philip Melanchthon had joined the faculty. At age 21, he was a veritable prodigy in learning. Next to that of Luther, the name that stands out most conspicuously in the whole history of the Reformation in Germany is Melanchthon. Luther was the great reformer and leader, Melanchthon the teacher of Germany. The two became close even though they were different in almost every way. They wonderfully complemented each other. I prefer the books of Magister Philippus to my own. I am rough, boisterous, stormy, altogether warlike. I'm born to fight against innumerable monsters and devils. I must remove stumps and stones, cut away thistles and thorns, and clear the wild forests. But Magister Philippus comes along softly and gently, sowing and watering with joy according to the gifts which God has abundantly bestowed upon him. Back at the city church at Wittenberg, Luther had promised to remain silent on the controversial questions if his opponents would refrain from attacking him. And he meant to keep his word, but it wasn't long before another confrontation. On June 27, 1519, Professor Eck of Ingolstadt challenged Luther to dispute with him at Leipzig. Luther saw that his disagreement with Rome was far more extensive than he expected. Luther now went beyond indulgences, or Tetzel's sale of indulgences, and challenged the very right of the Pope to issue indulgences. For five full days, Eck and Luther argued the important question of the 13th thesis about the supremacy of the Pope and the Roman Church. I admit that it is necessary for the Church to have a head, but this head is Christ himself. Eck was quick to draw the logical inferences of this assertion. If it be correct, then adherence to the Roman Church was not necessary to salvation. But this doctrine was the bohemian poison of John Huss. The Council of Constance had already condemned John Huss and burned him at the stake. Then Luther uttered the most decisive words of the whole disputation. It does not matter whether Wycliffe or Huss has taught this truth. It cannot be condemned. No Christian can be compelled to hold any doctrine which is not contained in the Holy Scriptures. Clearly, Luther had struck at the heart of the Roman Church. He questioned not only the Pope, but the 
church councils as well. Councils may err and have erred. Only the Bible is infallible. X reply was courteous and cold. Reverend Father, if you hold that a lawful council representing the Holy Catholic Church can err, I must consider you a heathen and a publican. A simple layman armed with the scriptures was superior to both pope and councils without them. Such a radical statement earned Luther a papal bull, a document that threatened excommunication. It was issued by Pope Leo X on 15th June, 1520. In this bull, called Exurge Domini, Pope Leo condemned Luther's teachings and called him a wild boar who had invaded the Lord's vineyard. The boar out of the woods is seeking to waste it, and a peculiar beast does devour it. It is prohibited in any way to read, quote, preach, commend, print, publish, or defend the writings of Luther. A diligent search should be made for said writings, and that they be publicly and solemnly burned in the presence of the clergy and the people. As to Martinus himself, if he does not recant, cut him and his followers off as withered branches not abiding in Christ. All faithful Christians are required, under penalty of excommunication, to arrest him and send him to Rome. An interdict will be pronounced on any place harboring Luther. Led by Johannes Bugenhagen, Luther's other supporters in Wittenberg refused to accept the bull as genuine. Elector Frederick the Wise insisted that his professor should not be condemned without a trial before impartial judges. The elector asked the famous humanist Erasmus for his opinion on the matter and received a trenchant reply. Luther has sinned in two respects. He touched the crown of the pope and the stomachs of the monks. Luther wrote to his close friend Spalatin. At last the Roman bull brought by Eck has arrived. I shall act as if it were a forged bull, although I believe that it is genuine. How do I wish that Emperor Charles were a man and would go for those Satans in the name of Christ? I have no fears as to my own person. God's will be done. Luther by now had a strong following in Wittenberg, but one who could not go down the road with him any further was his dear counselor and confessor, Dr. Staupitz, whom Luther called his father in the gospel. Staupitz resigned as vicar general of the Augustinians and retired to the court of the Archbishop of Salzburg, where he was forced to subscribe to the condemnation of the doctrines of his former pupil and friend. Staupitz spent the rest of his days in seclusion as an unhappy monk. Meanwhile, Luther replied to the bull that the Pope had sent. I address you, Leo X, and your cardinals of Rome. And to your face I freely say, I exhort and admonish you in the Lord to repent and to make an end of these diabolical blasphemies. Luther now could not retreat. It would violate his conscience, and besides, it would mean certain death. Luther decided that his safety lay in an act of unprecedented defiance. The Pope had demanded that the writings of the monk should be burned. So the monk responded by publicly burning the writings of the Pope. On 10th December, 1520, at this tree, a large pyre was erected. Most of the professors and nearly all the students and a crowd of citizens gathered. Martin Luther stepped forward. He placed the papal constitutions on top of the pyre. One of the teachers applied the torch. As the flames were leaping heavenward, Luther exclaimed, Because thou dost trouble Christ, the Holy One of the Lord, may eternal fire consume thee. 
Luther threw the bull of excommunication into the fire. It was for him a sacred act. He quietly left and returned to his cell, where he wrote a tract, Why the Books of the Pope and His Disciples Were Burned by Dr. Martin Luther. Luther's act was, in effect, separation from Rome. It was a declaration of independence from the Pope. On 3rd January, 1521, the Pope issued the final bull of excommunication. Luther and his followers, the Lutherans, were cut off from the church and given to eternal perdition. The bull commanded the emperor and all princes to punish him as a heretic including the death decree. In the summer of 1520, Luther wrote perhaps his three most important treatises. The first, Letters to the Christian Nobility, argued that all Christians are priests and urged rulers to implement the necessary reforms of the church. The second, on the Babylonian captivity of the church, reduced the seven sacraments to three, then later to only two, baptism and the Lord's Supper. Moreover, he radically changed the character of these sacraments. The third, on freedom of a Christian, proclaimed that Christians were free from the laws of the church and bound only in love to their neighbors. Meanwhile, on 28th June, 1519, Charles, King of Spain, was elected as emperor of the Holy Roman Empire of the German nation. That also made him the German emperor, but he did not know the German language. He had not even set foot in Germany. He scarcely knew the German princes or their names, so he desperately needed to woo them. In January 1521, he convened an imperial diet in the city of Worms on the Upper Rhine to meet the German princes. The papal nuncio Aleanda presented the Pope's excommunication of Luther and called for his execution. There are statements in Luther's writings sufficient on account of them for the burning of several thousand heretics. Since the Pope has already passed judgment, it is unnecessary to call the reprobate monk before the Diet. But to everyone's surprise, the Diet summoned Luther to appear within 21 days to defend his writings. He was promised safe passage for his travel to Worms. Would Luther go? He recalled the fate of John Huss, who was burned at the stake by Emperor Sigismund after he was promised safe passage. He also remembered the death of Savonarola. Luther knew that his own writings were burned by command of the Emperor of the Netherlands. Would Charles keep his word once Luther was within his grasp? A few months earlier, when Elector Frederick had asked his monk if he was willing to come to Worms if summoned, Luther had answered, If I am called, I shall go. And if I am too sick to go, I shall have them carry me. It is wrong to doubt that God calls me when the emperor calls. Before going, Luther remarked to Melanchthon, If I do not return and my enemies murder me, I conjure you, dear brother, to persevere in teaching the truth. If you remain, I could well be spared. Of course, Rome wanted the trial over with as quickly as possible. In fact, Rome advised no trial was necessary. It was only in order to pacify the unruly Germans that Luther was given another opportunity to recant. If he did not, he was to be condemned. Every detail was arranged, every question prepared. But when Luther left Wittenberg to attend the Diet, he was convinced he would finally get the hearing he had requested in 1517. 
Luther's journey to Worms became like a triumphant procession, whose climax was a rapturous welcome when he arrived. At four o'clock in the afternoon, on the day after his arrival, he appeared before the Diet. In awe, Luther stood before the Emperor Charles V. An eyewitness reported, The Emperor was seated on a chair of state which was covered with gold brocade and overhung by a canopy of the same material. On one side were seated all the electors, and on the other, the cardinals. The spacious hall was filled. Every eye was fixed upon Luther. In the midst was a table with a pile of books. The clerk demanded to know if Luther had written these books and if he would recant their contents. Luther was taken aback. He had expected a debate, not a judicial hearing. Luther seemed confused, stumbled, and begged for another day. This touches God and his word. This affects the salvation of souls. I beg you, give me time. This reply was unexpected. The Romanists were provoked. They wanted judgment pronounced at once. Luther's friends were perplexed. Some feared that he was intimidated and perhaps wavering. Finally, a respite of one day was granted. Back in his quarters, he wrote, So long as Christ is merciful, I will not recant a single jot or tittle. The next day, other proceedings of the Diet delayed Luther's return until evening. Darkness approached. Torches were being lit. The hall was even more crowded than on the previous day. April 18, 1521. Once again, the peasant's son stood before the most august assembly in the world. The prosecutor once again pressed Luther. Will you defend these books all together? Or do you wish to recant some of what you have said? It was a critical moment. In a firm, clear voice, he spoke first in Latin, and upon request, also in German. Some are about the Christian faith and good works, and these I certainly wouldn't retract. Some attack the papacy, and to retract these would be to encourage tyranny. Finally, in some I talk about the individuals, and perhaps too harshly, but still these couldn't be retracted because these people defended papal tyranny. Then the examiner declared, you must give a simple, clear, and proper answer. Will you recant or not? Luther stood firm. If convicted, I am willing and ready to revoke any error and shall be the first one to throw my books into the fire. Luther was told that his errors were nothing new and consequently needed no discussion. They were the old errors of Wycliffe and Huss condemned long ago by the Council of Constance. The examiner pressed again. Will you revoke these errors? We desire a plain answer, without horns or without cover. Unless I can be instructed and convinced with evidence from the Holy Scriptures or by clear and distinct grounds of reasoning, then I cannot and will not recant, because it is neither safe nor wise to act against conscience. Here I stand. I cannot do otherwise. God help me. Amen. Since Luther refused to recant, the Diet of Worms condemned him as a notorious heretic. He sadly left the room. I am finished. Luther was dismissed but not arrested. The emperor upheld Luther's safe conduct that guaranteed him 21 days of safe travel through the land. 
on April 25, 1521. Luther and the princes who supported him left Worms and headed home. A month later, on May 25, 1521, the fiercest edict ever issued by a German emperor pronounced the ban of the empire over Luther and all his sympathizers. Declaring Luther an outlaw, this edict was issued in the name of the German emperor and of the German princes. Yet it was not authorized by the Diet. It was never even submitted to the Diet. But in order to make it appear legitimate, it was dated back to May 8th. Luther and all his sympathizers were outlawed. Wherever Luther is found, he is to be arrested or even killed. Whoever dares to assist Luther in any way does so at his own risk. Luther's followers are to be driven from their homes and all their belongings can be appropriated by whoever desires to possess them. But where was Luther? No one knew. One thing was certain. He had not returned to Wittenberg. Some rumors declared the Papists had murdered him. Others that an enemy of the Elector held him captive. Others heard his corpse had been found in an abandoned mine. Today, in a narrow ravine near Bad Liebenstein, in the Thuringian Mountains, where the road winds up a hill through a dense forest of birch trees, stands the trunk of an old, weather-beaten, lightning-struck birch called Die Lutherbuche. Nearby, a monument commemorates what took place here on a dark evening in April 1521. Here, Luther was kidnapped, but kidnapped by a friend for his own safety. A few days later, it was known in the little city of Eisenach that the castle, towering above the city, hosted a noble guest who had arrived late one night in company with the lord of the castle. They called him Junker Jorg, Sir George. Soon, this mysterious knight had grown a full beard. Martin Luther was successfully disguised. Frederick the Wise was ready to swear an oath that he did not know where Luther was. He, of course, spoke the truth. The Elector did not know precisely to which castle his knights had taken Luther, nor did he want to know. He had simply given orders to bring the monk secretly to some safe hiding place and keep him there. Thus, Elector Frederick the Wise avoided liability for protecting an outlaw and a heretic. After the uneasy turmoil of recent months, the movement now had an interim in which to reflect and consolidate. Although Luther despised his captivity at the Wartburg, Luther also found these ten months to be among the most productive of his life. I'm getting very lazy here as well as working hard. I'm learning Hebrew and Greek and, and write without stopping for a break. I'm not worried about what is said about me in the wide world. At last I can sit in peace. In a little room with plain old furniture, all of it carved and massive, Martin Luther, disguised as Junker Jorg, poured day after day over his books, wrote letters, pamphlets, sermons, and gave to his people a gift of priceless value. I will stay here until Easter. I will work on the sermon collection until then. I also want to translate the New Testament into German. This is expected of me by the people. There was urgent need for a German Bible. Luther insisted that Christians be rooted in God's Word. No clearer book has been written in this wide world than the Bible. 
Compared with all other books, it is like the sun over all other lights. Don't let them lead you out and away from it, much as they may try to do so. For if you step out, you are lost. They take you wherever they wish. If you remain within, you will be victorious. Luther was not the first to translate the Bible into German. When the art of printing was introduced, a number of German Bibles were printed. When Luther commenced his work, there were at least 14 translations in High German and four in Low German dialects. But they were all based upon the Latin Vulgate of Jerome. It was over a thousand years old, and now far better sources were available such as the Greek New Testament text used by Erasmus just a few years earlier in 1519. Luther's Bible clearly excelled over the other attempts and became the great religious and moral classic of the German people. Luther was thoroughly familiar with the whole Bible. He lived in the thoughts of the Bible. This was of importance. For as he said, A good translation requires a truly devout, faithful, diligent Christian, a learned, experienced, practical heart. Luther's Bible also excelled because he had a mastery of the language of the German people. His humble birth in a peasant family, his constant mingling with the people, prepared Luther for this great task. In the 16th century, there was no single German language. There were a variety of German dialects. Luther did not adopt any of the various dialects. He used the language of the Saxon government offices, but simplified it. In March 1522, when he was ready to leave his castle prison, the New Testament was finished. A second imperial diet was held in Nuremberg in 1522 and declared the judgment against Luther as unenforceable. This made it possible for Luther to return to Wittenberg where his presence was desperately needed. Luther wrote to the elector Frederick the Wise, I am needed. I write this to apprise you that I am on my way to Wittenberg, protected by one who is higher than the elector. I do not ask for the protection of the elector. I even think that I can protect him better than he can protect me. Did I think that I had to put my trust in the elector, I should not come at all. The sword is powerless here. God alone must act without man's interference. He who has most faith will be the most powerful protector. On March 6, 1522, Martin Luther mounted his pulpit in Wittenberg and preached on the obligation to love thy neighbor. In 1522 through 1524, Luther went on preaching trips throughout central Germany. And during the fall of 1522, even in Erfurt, in Weimar, it was important to Luther to proclaim the gospel to the people. In 1524, however, at the Third Imperial Diet of Nuremberg, the banishment against Luther was renewed, but the Reformation had rooted itself so deeply by then that it seemed unlikely that he would be arrested. Before he reached his 50th birthday, Luther was worn out. His bodily infirmities multiplied. He suffered agonies with kidney troubles and other severe ailments. Yet Luther's personal communion with God remained unshaken. He could not slow down. Between 1516 and 1530, excluding Bible translations, Luther put out 360 publications. From 1531 to his death, in 1546, he added another 184 titles to this incredible total. 
Included was his last blow against the Roman Church with the publication in 1545 of Against the Papacy in Rome Founded by the Devil. Luther led the Reformation in its fight against its enemies even in the last years of his life. He continued his regular activities, including lectures at the university and preaching at the parish church. On November 10, 1545, he celebrated his birthday with his family and friends. He had a foreboding a few days earlier that this birthday would be his last. I am tired of this world. I shall lay me down in a coffin and give the worms a plump doctor to feast on. A week later, in his lecture room, he finished the exposition on the book of Genesis with the words, I can do no more. I am weak. I am as ready to depart as a traveler is to leave his lodging place. The Counts of Mansfeld desired him to act as arbiter in some quarrels which they had among themselves. Though feeble in body, he went on his errand of peace three times. On the last trip in January 1546, he was accompanied by his sons. A conference of dissenting parties was arranged at isolated. Luther's help was physically failing. Calm his wife's apprehension, comforted her with letters. Dear Kate, dismiss your cares, for I have one who cares for me better than you or angels can. Only pray and let God do all the caring. For it is written, cast all your care upon him. The arbitration proceedings drew to an end. Luther thought of returning home, but his strength was gone. On February 16th, in this bedroom, he wrote in the last written words we have from him. No one can understand Virgil in his Georgics, unless he has been a tiller of the soil for at least five years. No one can fully understand Cicero in his epistles, unless he has moved about in a large commonwealth for 25 years. No one can fancy to have thoroughly mastered the Holy Scriptures, unless he has for a hundred years lived in the church together with the prophets, with Christ, and his apostles. The next day he was seized with alarming pain in his chest. He found no rest, neither in reclining or walking. His friends assembled, physicians were summoned. The Count of Mansfeld and his countess hastened to minister to him. Luther was heard to pray. O Lord Jesus Christ, I commend my poor soul to Thee. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Into Thy hands I commend my spirit, for Thou hast redeemed me, Thou God of truth. And everything was quiet. Pastor Jonas bent over the dying man and called into his ear. Reverend Father, do you die in the faith of your Lord Jesus Christ and in the doctrine which you preached in his name? Yes. After his clear and distinct answer in this room, Luther went to sleep and was no more. In the same city of Eisleben, where he was born, Luther died on 18th February, 1546, faithful to his words that he had once written to his father. This wretched life is nothing but a veil of tears. The longer a man lives, the more sin and wickedness and plague and sorrow he sees and feels. 
nor is there respite or cessation this side of grave. There is, however, repose, and we can then sleep in the rest Christ gives us until he comes again to wake us with joy. Amen. The news of Luther's death spread. A special messenger carrying a full account of the last days and the dying hours written by Dr. Jonas was dispatched at once to Wittenberg. When the news arrived, Melanchthon was in his classroom, lecturing on the epistle to the Romans. Oh God, gone is the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. The shock of her husband's death crushed Katharina. For who would not be sad and afflicted at the loss of such a precious man as my dear Lord was? He did great things, not just for a city or a single land, but for the whole world. I am so deeply grieved that I cannot eat or drink or even sleep. And if I had a principality or an empire and lost it, it would not have been as painful as this is now that the dear Lord God has taken him from me, this precious and beloved man. And oh, not from me alone, but from the whole world. Katharina never recovered from her grief. From that day on, she referred to herself as the widow of Dr. Martin Luther. Katharina died in Torgau six years later. She rests in this church, just a few hundred kilometers from the grave of her beloved doctor in Wittenberg. Melanchthon added these words to this last portrait of Martin Luther, drawn by his valet, Reifenstein. Dr. Martin Luther, alive I was your plague, O Pope. Dead, I shall destroy you. He died in the year 1546. He lived for 63 years. The 64th year was the year of his death. It was the 18th of February when he encountered death at night between 2 and 3 o'clock. On the 22nd of the month, he was buried in the castle church of Wittenberg. He is dead, yet he lives. I bid you welcome, noble guest. With these words from Martin Luther's Christmas hymn, we greet the newborn Jesus Christ. But God offers an even warmer welcome to us when we believe in his Son. And as Luther wrote in 1522, Your salvation is assured not in the fact that you believe that Christ is a Christ for the pious, but that he is a Christ for you, and that he is yours by faith. On July 6, 1415, John Huss was condemned as a heretic and burned at the stake for challenging the authority of the church. In his native Czech language, his name Huss meant goose. Before being led to his martyrdom, he wrote, They may kill a goose, but a hundred years from now, a swan will arise, which they will not be able to kill. These were prophetic words. Less than 100 years later, the man of destiny was born. His mighty and penetrating voice was heard throughout Europe and could not be stifled by fire or sword. His words shook 
the foundations of the most colossal religious system the world had ever seen. To his followers, he was a hero, the leader who restored the core of the Christian faith. In this man, we have an honored, good, and learned leader of true Christian piety. He is the first man of our age who did not merely see the weeds growing in Christ's field, but who had the courage to pull them out with his powerful hoe and busy hand. He is a man who truly reflects the image of Christ. Highly admired by all, he now firmly proclaims Christ and is willing even to be crucified for him. Yet to this day, his opponents denounce him as a heretic and deceiver who has led souls to their damnation for centuries. He is the son of iniquity, who fears no authority and accepts no rebuke. He should be delivered into the power and judgment of the Holy See. He and his followers are heretics. They are to be excommunicated, anathematized, and cursed, and be burned. He asserts in unchristian fashion that his most evil errors are Christian. There is no doubt that he is a heretic. He is a notorious heretic, a limb cut off from the Church of God, an obstinate, schismatic, and manifest heretic. Martin Luther is buried in this castle church in Wittenberg, Germany, the Augustinian monk who shook the world. Guided by his conscience, his courage, and faith, he challenged the powerful hierarchy of the late medieval Roman Catholic Church and accused it of perverting the Christian religion. By demanding reform, he sparked the most important grassroot religious movement in the Western world, the Reformation. This revolution of conscience resulted in the separation that gave birth to the Protestant faith and changed the course of human history. Martin Luther was born during a time of great upheaval characterized by new discoveries and innovations that were radically transforming daily life. A new view of the world was emerging, and yet old habits were dying hard. This transitional period between the Middle Ages and the Modern Ages was also the world of Machiavelli, Copernicus, Columbus, Michelangelo, Raphael, and Leonardo da Vinci. In 1450, Johannes Gutenberg revolutionized printing by inventing a new process. Copernicus developed the heliocentric view of the universe, later expanded by Giordano Bruno. Bruno was burned a heretic. New inventions in seafaring and navigation led to historic sea voyages and geographical discoveries. In 1492, Columbus arrived in the Americas. By 1521, Ferdinand de Magellan had sailed around the world. His humble birth in a peasant family, his constant mingling with the people, prepared Luther for this great task. In March 1522, when he was ready to leave his castle prison, the New Testament was finished. After his return to Wittenberg, he spent several months with Melanchthon and others in a thorough revision of the New Testament text. Each sheet was handed to the printer as soon as finished, and in September 1523, the whole New Testament came off the press. It had the simple title, Das Neve Testament Deutsche Wittenberg, without the names of either translator or printer. Luther 
did not want anybody to be prejudiced for or against the book by his name, which by this time was worshipped by some, but despised by others. Das Neve Testament Deutsche was a typographical masterpiece containing woodcuts from Lukas Granach's workshop and selections from the famous Apocalypse series by Albrecht Durer. The sale of the book exceeded all expectations. The first edition of 5,000 copies sold out in less than three months in spite of the high price of what would today be nearly $100. In some countries, the sale was forbidden. Roman Catholic theologians warned it was more harmful than the magical books of the Ephesians mentioned in the Book of Acts. One of Luther's Catholic opponents lamented, Luther's New Testament was so much multiplied and spread by printers that even tailors and shoemakers, even women and ignorant persons who could read but little, studied it with the greatest avidity as the fountain of truth. Some committed it to memory and carried it about in their bosoms. Within a few months, such people deemed themselves so learned that they were not ashamed to dispute about the faith in the gospel, not only with Catholic laymen, but even with priests and monks and doctors of divinity. The New Testament had not left the press when Luther turned his attention to the Old Testament. But now the greatest difficulties began. Ach Gott! How hard and laborious it is to compel the Hebrew writers to speak German. How they do resist and refuse to leave their Hebrew and imitate the barbaric German tongue. Just as if one tried to force the nightingale to leave her fine tune and imitate the cuckoo, whose tone she abhors. I openly confess that I took too much upon myself when I decided to translate the Old Testament. But the work progressed in spite of the difficulties. Though Luther was a scholar in both Greek and Hebrew, he would not attempt it alone. Translators must never work by themselves. When one is alone, the best and most suitable words do not always occur to him. Luther set a precedent by forming a translation committee, calling it his Sanhedrin, to which he invited the best scholars, including Philip Melanchthon, Eustace Jonas, and Johannes Bugenhagen. Luther spared no pains to make the version both accurate and popular. He wrote to Erasmus, inquiring concerning the names of coins, and he requested his friend Spalatin to study the jewels in the possession of the elector Frederick the Wise and to give him their exact names. Luther inquired of mechanics the correct designations of their tools. He even had a butcher kill a lamb and explain to him the proper terms for the various parts used in the sacrificial code of the ancient Hebrews. He did all this so he could translate the original Hebrew into the best possible German. He wanted his Bible to be in spoken rather than bookish or written German. It had to sound right. At last, the task was accomplished. In 1534, the whole Bible was printed. Because of its cadence and readability, Luther's Bible, even today, remains a popular Bible in Germany. Between the years 1534 and 1575, Hans Luft, Luther's printer, sold over 100,000 copies, an immense sale for those times. Besides, there being no copyright, there were 52 reprints in other cities. Luther never asked for nor received a penny for the greatest work of his life. The influence of Luther and the German Bible reached well beyond the borders of the empire. Its ripples were felt in many countries. Most importantly, the Bible left a permanent impression on William Tyndale, 
one of the most wanted men in 16th century England. Known as the father of the English Bible, William Tyndale was pursued by King Henry VIII. Luther's legacy continues to live on through Tyndale's English translation, which makes up more than 90% of the King James New Testament and more than 75% of the Revised Standard Version. Besides the translation of the Bible, Luther also penned the Small Catechism and the Large Catechism in 1529 as tools for teaching doctrine. But the thought never crossed Luther's mind that the doctrine on which he stood was his own. It is not my doctrine, not my creation, but God's gift. Dear Lord God, it was not spun out of my head, nor grown in my garden, nor did it flow out of my spring, nor was it born of me. It is God's gift, not a human discovery. The first decades of the 16th century witnessed turbulence and change in Europe. The old feudal system of the Middle Ages was slowly giving way to a new social structure of commerce and new ideas of citizenship. Restless peasants sought the chance to shake off the oppressive yoke of feudalism. By emphasizing in his writings that nobles and peasants were equal, Thomas Mintzer instigated the peasants to a bloody revolt. The German revolutionists were also inspired by Luther's great doctrine of the liberty of the Christian. In a peculiar effort to mix religion with politics, they demanded that no civil law be recognized as binding unless proven from the scriptures. All eyes turned toward Luther. Would he support civil liberty based upon the religious liberty he had so effectively preached? Luther's enemies feared that he extended his religious revolution into the economic and political orders. After all, in his tract, Exhortation to Peace, respecting the Twelve Articles, he reproves the princes and the nobility. You must give room to God's word. If you do not yield out of your own free will, you will be compelled by defeats and distress. Even if those peasants should fail to humble and chastise you, others will not. God will punish you. The people cannot and will not suffer your tyranny and wantonness much longer. God will tolerate it no longer. The world is no more what it formerly was when you used to drive and chase people like beasts of the field. But Luther was by no means ready to lead a peasant uprising. He warned them not to call their league a Christian union. Wrongs perpetrated by those in authority are no excuse for rebellion. If the rulers refuse to do right, God will find a way to punish them. But Christians must always defend law and order against mob rule, self-help, and anarchy. The revolutionists cannot call upon God since they rely exclusively on their own fists. Luther could not keep the peasants under control. Centuries of pent-up anger and resentment burst forth in a peasant revolt. Beginning in southern Germany and then spreading north, the peasants were convinced that God was on their side. One of the troops called itself the Army of God. This most notorious leader was Thomas Mintzer, who organized the cloth weavers in Zwickau, urging them to establish the kingdom of God on earth. His passionate eloquence aroused people wherever he appeared. The unrest spread and events swung Luther over to the side of the princes. Luther heard of unspeakable atrocities. He saw the ruins of castles and monasteries. An angry and indignant Luther sat down and wrote his fiercest and most passionate treatise he ever penned, 
against the murderous, rioting bands of peasants, in which he urged the princes to take decisive action against the peasants. Smite, strangle, and stab the peasants, secretly or openly, for nothing can be more poisonous, hurtful, or devilish than a rebel. It's just as when one must kill a mad dog. If you don't strike him, he will strike you and the whole land with you. Do not hesitate to cut, knock down, and kill. This is a service of love, to save your neighbor from the bonds of the devil and of hell. Luther had his way. Retribution came quickly. The nobility rallied and defeated the poorly trained crowds of peasants. Now the tables were turned and the noblemen gratified their revenge and rancor in a most beastly manner. The peasants were brutally defeated in the Battle of Frankenhuisen, and their leader, Thomas Mincer, was executed. It is estimated that about 100,000 peasants were killed, many of them after excruciating tortures. The terrible cruelties inflicted upon the helpless peasants stunned all Germany. Luther's enemies seized their chance, and Luther was held responsible for all the misery of the fatal war, for the ruined castles, the devastated fields, the ravaged villages, and all the untold sufferings. The princes accused him of having incited the peasants the peasants reproached him for having forsaken them in their distress. The Roman Catholic authorities thought the time had come to implement the Edict of Worms, which placed Luther and his followers under the ban of the empire. Everywhere, the evangelicals were persecuted. In the little region of Württemberg alone, over 40 preachers were hanged or burned at the stake the effects of the peasant war devastated Germany and damaged the progress of the Reformation. Luther's call to repress the peasants remains controversial to this day. This portrait of Luther in the Peasants' War Panorama in Bad Frankenhausen shows Luther as having two faces. Martin Luther was still in Wartburg when he heard that his friends Karlstadt and Justus Jonas had married. He wrote to Spalatin, Good heavens! Will our Wittenbergers give wives to monks? They won't force a wife on me. In Wittenberg? Erfurt? Magdeburg? and other cities throughout Germany, monks were abandoning their monasteries and nuns were fleeing their cloisters. Some left voluntarily, but others were being forced under the belief that all Christians must become lay people and must get married. At the same time, defenders of the old church insisted monastic vows must be kept. As a form of protest, three priests married in 1521. By September, Luther was pondering the implication of his theology on the status of monastic vows. Here, his concern was personal. To keep a rash vow made in terror during a storm, he had entered the monastery. Monks and nuns who fled the monastery could be severely punished in both canon and secular laws. Some men and women were forced to enter monastic life by their families. Erasmus claimed his guardians put him in the monastery so they could steal his inheritance. Risking criticism from both sides, Luther favored moderation. If one could serve one's neighbor in holy orders, then one should remain. On the other hand, if one could serve the neighbor better outside the monastery or cloister, then one should live in the world, and monastic vows were not binding. Luther had lived a monastic life for years. 
he felt he knew what he was talking about. Thus, Luther maintained one could be released from a vow of celibacy and marry, as the vow in the first place was not from God, but a human regulation required by Rome. Yet, Luther was committed to his vow of celibacy. But by 1525, a former nun, Katharina von Bora, succeeded in changing Luther's mind. Luther came to hold a high view of marriage and regarded enforced celibacy as evil. He permitted monks and nuns to renounce their false vows and to marry. He actively encouraged fathers to liberate their daughters from convents. Like Abraham, I'm the father of a great people, for I am responsible for all the children of the monks and nuns who have renounced their monastic vows. In 1523, when his reformatory ideas filtered into the Cistercian cloister in Nimchen near Grima, Katharina von Bora and 11 other nuns appealed to Luther to help them escape. Katharina von Bora was five when she had entered the Benedictine convent following her father's remarriage and was consecrated a nun in this abbess at the early age of 16. She was now 24. Because punishment for liberating a nun was death, nuns were kept in strict seclusion. Luther devised an ingenious plan with a Torgau councilman, Leonhard Koppa, who regularly delivered herring to the cloister. On the night of Easter Sunday, April 4, 1523, Koppa and his two helpers smuggled the 12 nuns out of the cloister inside empty herring barrels and brought them to Wittenberg, where, according to an eyewitness, a wagon load of Vestal virgins had just come to town, all more eager for marriage than for life. Luther praised Leonhard Koppa and compared the freeing of the sisters to the deliverance of the children of Israel from Egypt by Moses. Luther helped find suitable placement for these and other nuns as teachers or to find husbands for them. He had a husband in view for Miss von Bora. But when Pastor Amsdorf told her who it was, she haughtily replied that she would either accept Amsdorf or Dr. Luther, but not the one proposed. But Luther had other things on his mind. I am not now inclined to take a wife. Not that I lack the feelings of a man, for I am neither wood nor stone. But my mind is so averse to marriage because I daily expect the death decreed to the heretic. Luther's prince and protector, Elector Frederick the Wise, died on May 5, 1525, after having received the Lord's Supper in both forms and declining the last rites of the Catholic Church. He was the first German prince who at death rested in faith in Christ alone and not upon the mediatory offices of the church. Though he never personally met Luther, he was a prudent protector of the bold monk. Then just a little over one month after Frederick's death, on June 13, 1525, without consulting anyone, and in the presence of only a few of his most intimate friends, Luther married Katharina von Bora. If I had not married her quickly and quietly, only a few friends knowing it, they all would have prevented it. For even my best friends cried, not this one, but someone else. The news of the marriage spread rapidly and caused sensation everywhere. Many of his friends were shocked and grieved. Melanchthon, who did not attend the marriage ceremony, poured out his heart in a long letter in the Greek language. This man of God was roped in by some shrewd nun. His intimate friend, the lawyer Schoff, exclaimed, 
If this monk takes a wife, the whole world, even the devil, will laugh, and his whole work will come to naught. But Luther saw it differently. The angels will rejoice, and the devil shall weep. To his Catholic opponents, Luther's marriage was the very evidence of his disgrace and shamelessness. King Henry VIII called his marriage a crime. One Catholic writer lamented, What a pity! Catherine, a poor fallen woman, has passed from the cloistered holy religion into a damnable shameful life. Another opponent gleefully exclaimed, Now, at last, the true character of the monk has come to light. His whole opposition against the church sprang from impure personal motives. His controlling passion was lust. He was carnal, fell in love, and wanted to have a wife. That was the whole secret of it. But according to Luther, both he and Katie had begged God earnestly for grace and guidance before they married. Luther wrote to his friend Nicholas Amsdorf, I hope to live a short time, yet to gratify my father who asked me to marry and leave him descendants. And moreover, so that I would confirm by my example what I have taught, God has willed and caused my act. For I neither love my wife nor burn for her, but esteem her. In the wake of the Reformation, the Augustinian monastery was dissolved, and Luther stayed there as the last monk. As a wedding present, the elector donated the monastery to Luther and exempted it from all taxes. The monastery was no cozy home. It was built as a cloister for men, consisting of rows of small cells. But Luther's buoyant wife eagerly transformed the dismal monastery into a cheerful home. Though there had not been much romance in Luther's courtship, his married life proved to be very happy. Kate, you have a man who loves you. As the years passed by, their love grew stronger and deeper. I would not surrender my Katie for France and Venice together. Katharina reciprocated these feelings in her gift of this special entryway on their wedding anniversary in 1540. Luther called it Katharina's portal. Enjoying mutual respect, they lived out an effective partnership. If in a marriage the husband shows no forbearance toward his wife and the wife none toward her husband, then the married state will soon become a tyranny and everything will be ruined. She ran the house, managed the finances, looked after the children, and brewed the beer. While her husband preached, worked, wrote books, traveled throughout Germany, and drank the beer. Though overburdened with the ministry and other responsibilities, he insisted on working with his wife at domestic tasks. It was a right and proper part of the Christian faith for a man to join his wife at the wash tub and wash the swaddling clothes. Luther made all important decisions jointly with her. He referred to her in his letters with a mixture of respect and amusement as Mein Herr Kefter, meaning My Lord Katie. I am an inferior lord, she the superior. I am Aaron. She is my Moses. With good humor, he bore her criticism of his poor business instincts. If I can survive the wrath of the devil in my sinful conscience, I can withstand the anger of Catherine von Bora. Luther was fond of teasing Catherine. In his letters, he calls her all kinds of pet names. His favorite, Kitty, my rib. He also dubbed her the morning star of Wittenberg, as her day began at four in the morning. Luther also acknowledged his respect for Katie's abilities in his last will and testament. The German practice was to appoint a male trustee to administer a deceased husband's estate for his widow and children. But Luther directly designated her 
heir to everything. Thus he acknowledged that to him, she was everything. This life has nothing more lovely and delightful than a woman who loves her husband. On June 7, 1526, the Luthers were fruitful. Their firstborn was Johannes, also known as Hans. My Catherine is fulfilling Genesis 1.28. From that most gracious woman, I have received a little son. Ah, these are the joys of marriage, of which the Pope is not worthy. When they were blessed with a daughter, Elizabeth, Martin Luther wrote to her godmother, Dear lady, God has produced from me and my wife, Katie, a little heathen. We hope you will be willing to become her spiritual mother and help make her a Christian. Unfortunately, Elizabeth died in less than a year. My little daughter, Elizabeth, is dead. It is marvelous that how sick at heart it has left me. So much do I grieve for her. I would never have believed that a father's heart could be so tender for his child. Pray the Lord for me. On May 4, 1529, another infant girl brightened their home. They named her Magdalena. Luther's affection for her was deep. But by her 14th birthday, his heart was broken a second time by the loss of a child. Two conflicting passions shook Luther's heart to its very depth. Submission to God and love for his daughter. As Magdalena lay very ill, Luther prayed. I love her very much, but dear God, if it be thy will to take her, I submit to thee. Then, as she lay on her deathbed, Luther said to her, Magdalena, my little daughter, would you like to stay with your father here, or would you willingly go to your father in heaven? Magdalena answered, Yes. Dear Father, as God wills. Then she died in his arms. As he laid her in the coffin, he said, Beloved Lena, you will rise and shine like a star, yea, like the sun. For a time, even prayer could not stop his burning tears. So strong is natural affection that we must sob and groan in heart under the oppression of killing grief. Even the death of Christ is unable to take all this away as it should. Their other four children survived to adulthood. Hans became a law student after his father's death and accepted a government position. Martin studied theology but did not enter the ministry. He died at the age of 39. Paul studied medicine and became a great physician. Margareta married a wealthy nobleman. Luther provided a model for Protestant family life. Children must be trained to obedience in their own homes. Where there is no good root, there can grow neither good tree nor fruit. Luther replaced the priestly celibacy with an exalted view of the option of marriage as part of ministry. The late 1520s saw a major turning point in Martin Luther's life and career. Luther never set out nor desired to organize a new church. The Catholic Church had a finely developed organization. At first, all that Luther worked for was a reformation of the existing church and establishing the Bible as supreme authority instead of the Pope. Quite against his will, Luther became a center of the Reformation and a large part of the Protestant movement. The center of the Catholic worship is the Mass, the priest, by virtue of his office, does what no layman can do. Namely, he changes the elements of a Eucharist into the very body and blood of Christ as a sacrifice. Luther retained the name of Mass, 
It came from the Latin, mission, to send. But he used this term to designate the principal Sunday worship service, concluding with the communion. Catholic doctrine of transubstantiation was rejected. Everything else was made subservient to preaching, and thus the whole service was intended for the instruction and edification of the congregation. The use of the Latin language was abolished, and the common language was introduced. Besides the stated Sunday services, Luther encouraged the earnest Christians to meet in smaller groups for the purpose of reading the Bible together. He preached the universal priesthood of all believers. Luther did not even consider ordination as absolutely necessary in order to preach. He repeatedly urged Melanchthon to preach in Wittenberg, although Melanchthon was not officially ordained by any church of God. To serve at the altar, ordination of priests by bishops was considered unnecessary. The candidates for the ministry were ordained before the assembled congregation by the laying on of hands by the elders. Meanwhile, the emperor, as well as the pope, were kept busy with greater political schemes. Charles V needed the goodwill and the assistance of the German princes. So, for years, the Edict of Worms against Luther was not enforced. In 1526, however, Charles V defeated his most dangerous enemy, the King of France, in the decisive Battle of Pavia, and intended to coerce the dissenting German princes to conform to the Roman Catholic Church. He summoned them to the city of Spire for an imperial diet. Before the diet could open, Pope Clement VII formed an unsuccessful alliance with the French king against Charles V, whose troops stormed into Rome in May 1527. Luther wrote triumphantly, Rome is miserably devastated. Christ reigns. The emperor, while persecuting Luther to please the pope, is compelled by vanquishing the pope to please Luther. Everything must serve Christ in favor of his own and against his enemies. However, the victory of Charles V did not improve the prospects of the Reformation. He called the Second Diet of Spire and gave notice. I save no pains in order to oppose the pestilence of Luther and to bring back the erring members into the folds of the church. The evangelical princes went to the Diet of Spire. They were hopelessly outnumbered. The Diet and joined all to execute the Edict of Worms against Luther. The Catholics were preparing to crush the Evangelicals. The Evangelical party protested. In matters pertaining to God's honor and our soul salvation, everyone must stand and give an account of himself before God. They presented these articles of protestation on April 20, 1529. Henceforth, they were called Protestants. While the Catholics were generally agreed, the Evangelicals were split into various groups. Politically, it was vital that the Protestants stand together, but their passion for doctrinal purity divided them. As Luther once wrote of radical reformer Thomas Muntzer, I am not so much offended by the unfruitfulness of the spirit of Munzer as I am by his lying and his attempt to establish other doctrines. Luther's clashes with the other reformers began early with Andreas Karlstadt, who was Luther's senior in both age and tenure as professor at the University of Wittenberg. He had promoted Luther to the doctorate in 1512 and later collaborated with Luther and Philip Melanchthon in reforming Wittenberg's curriculum. In 1518, Karlstadt was summoned along with Luther to Leipzig for the famous disputation against Eck. At the Christmas Day Mass of 1521, Karlstadt took the radical step 
of offering both the bread and wine to the faithful. And the next day, he announced his decision to get married, a scandal in an age of celibate clergy. He called for the removal of all images in the churches. In 1522, when Luther returned to Wittenberg from his exile in Wartburg, he confronted Karlstadt's radicalism. Under pressure, Karlstadt resigned from the university, but continued to advance his ideas for reform and anticipated many Anabaptist and Baptist ideas of the 1500s and 1600s. Karlstadt rejected infant baptism and viewed the Lord's Supper as a memorial service. In 1524, Luther used his political influence to have Karlstadt banished from electoral Saxony. However, a year later, when Karlstadt was fleeing the peasant war and needed refuge, Luther sheltered him in his home. Karlstadt met Zwinglian leaders of the Reformation in Switzerland, eventually being won to their cause. In 1534, he was appointed professor at Basel, where he would later die of the plague in 1541. Zwingli joined Karlstadt in the war of words against Luther. The verbal combat between the Lutherans and Zwinglians concerned the German lay leaders of Protestantism, especially Prince Philip of Hesse. He was by far the most able statesman among the evangelicals. Philip wanted unity for political reasons and called Luther and Zwingli to meet at his castle in Marburg in 1529. The delegates arrived from Wittenberg and Zurich. If they would reach agreement, it would mean not only religious harmony, but also a united political party extending from the coast of the Baltic Sea to the Alps of Switzerland. But Philip of Hesse underestimated the radical difference in the characters of the two men, especially the strength of dogmatic stubbornness of Luther. Though Luther rejected the Catholic doctrine of transubstantiation, he still believed in the real presence of the body and blood of Christ, along with the bread and wine. He taught that with, under, and in the elements of the Eucharist, Christ was literally present and was bodily received by the faithful. Luther insisted, this is my body, literatum and verbatim. His position was called consubstantiation. Zwingli agreed with the more radical position of Karlstadt that the bread and wine signified the body and blood which were not actually physically present. He saw in the Eucharist a confession of the Church to the risen Christ and a memorial of his death. Zwingli said, this means my body symbolically as a remembrance at which the presence of Christ was nevertheless spiritually real. Luther wrote with chalk on the table before him the words, hoc est corpus meum and to those words he clung. He insisted the truth was on his side, and though willing to hear the opposite opinions, he would not budge an inch from the letter of God's word. For three days, the disputation continued in this hall. Then it was clear, even to Philip, they had reached an impasse. Upon his request, 14 articles were drawn up, on which all agreed. The 15th stated the difference in opinion and was worded very carefully. Both sides agreed that in the Holy Communion, the faithful should receive both bread and wine. And both sides denied the Roman Catholic doctrine of the Mass as a sacrifice. But on the question of the nature of the real presence, they differed. Ironically, although they agreed on 14 of 15 points, they parted ways on the Lord's Supper, that which Jesus had given as the sign of the unity of his followers. When parting, Zwingli assured Luther that he wanted his friendship and wished it now. 
He held out his hand to him. Luther refused to shake hands and curtly replied, You have a different spirit. Ask God that he may convert you. Hearing this answer, another Swiss reformer lost his patience and said, You had better ask him also, for you need it just as much as we do. Thus they parted. The breach in the ranks of the evangelicals widened. Luther had given to his people the Bible, the Catechism, an order of worship, but they still had no hymns which could be sung by the congregation. The old church hymns were read or chanted by the clergy alone and were not adapted to congregational singing. Luther desired to fill this need, but his efforts met with stiff resistance from other reformers. Although Zwingli was a trained musician, he banned playing of organs during church service. Some of his followers even destroyed organs in their churches. John Calvin, though he considered music a gift of God, permitted only unison singing of the psalms and disallowed harmonies. He considered instrumental music to be senseless and absurd. For both of them, music was too worldly, too closely associated with dancing and other general enjoyments. Not so for Martin Luther. He wanted a singing church. As part of church service, he accepted music, whether sung or played, whether arranged for one voice or for several. I am not of the opinion that all arts are to be cast down and destroyed on account of the gospel, as some fanatics protest. On the other hand, I would gladly see all arts, especially music, in the service of him who has given and created them. Why should the devil have all the good music? Thus, congregational music during worship owes its origins to Martin Luther. In 1522, Luther urged Svalatin and others to compose sacred hymns, especially to transcribe the Old Testament Psalms in German verse. He advised them to speak as plainly as possible. Use the simplest and most common words. Preserve the pure teaching of God's word and keep the meaning as close to the Psalms as possible. Thomas Münzer had already produced German services and hymns. To shelter his people from Münzer's errors, Luther decided to write hymns of his own. The year 1524, may be called the birth year of the Evangelical Church Hymn. In that year, Luther's first hymnal was published. It contained only eight hymns, four of them Luther's own composition. He published two more hymnals in the course of the same year. The last one, the Geistliches Gesangbuch, contained 32 hymns, of which 24 were written by Luther himself. He would go on to write a dozen more, in addition to putting the old Latin texts to German, he also adapted their melodies to the German style of speaking and singing. He took great pain in selecting appropriate tunes for his hymns. He chose the best of the existing tunes, both sacred and secular. Occasionally, the melodies were like popular dance tunes, but he ensured that they were dignified and elevating. There were some genuine folk songs, but these were soon taken up by composers and further developed. Thirty-seven hymns that Luther wrote are still printed in modern hymn books. They include the well-known Christmas carol, From Heaven Above to Earth I Come. The best known of all his hymns is his grand Ein fester Burg ist unser Gott, A mighty fortress is our God. In the hymn, he feeds upon Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble.
This hymn became the war cry and the triumphal song of the Reformation. Today, the first line of this hymn encircles the tower of the castle church in Wittenberg. This hymn, along with others, was soon known by heart and sung everywhere, becoming an effective means of spreading the gospel. Luther's opponents complained that people simply sang themselves into the new faith. The Holy Roman Emperor Charles V summoned the dissident Protestant princes and leaders to the meeting at Augsburg on April 6, 1530. Elector John called Luther and other reformers to formulate articles of faith which might be presented to the Diet. These articles formed the first draft of the constitution of the Lutheran Church. Accompanied by his counselors and his theologians, the Elector proceeded to Augsburg. Still being under the ban of the Emperor, Luther was left at Coburg Castle, not very far from Augsburg. Melanchthon presented a document in defense of their beliefs. This written defense was known as the Apology. Afterward, its name was changed more appropriately to Confessio, an enduring summary of the evangelical faith, the Augsburg Confession. The confession was meant to approach the Roman Catholic position as closely as possible without surrendering any crucial issue. It summed up the Lutheran position in 21 articles and then listed Catholic practices that needed to be changed. These included prohibiting clergy to marry and withholding the Eucharist cup from the laity. The confession of the evangelical faith was read before the highest tribunal in the empire. In Coburg Castle, Luther expressed his joy. I am exceedingly glad to have lived to this hour in which Christ was preached in so glorious a confession. The Roman theologians presented a rebuttal known as the Confutatio. The evangelicals declined to accept the confutation and tired of the fruitless efforts, some of them returned home. The final decision of the Diet was the renewed command to carry out the Edict of Worms against Luther. Fearing war in the immediate future, the evangelical estates formed the League of Schmalkalden. The elector invited Luther to draw up a series of articles which must be asserted and from which no departure should be made under any circumstances. Luther wrote the first draft of the so-called Schmalkalden Articles. Pope Paul III, after long delay, called a council to Mantua in Italy. But the Council of Mantua did not materialize. In its place, the Council of Trent was later held in 1545, and there, Catholic creed was set forth in contradistinction to the Lutheran confessions. But the Augsburg Confession had made its impression, and it was a lasting one. The Augsburg Confession became the standard for Lutheran theology and still defines Lutheran Christianity. It carries the weight of a Declaration of Independence. It is true that Luther stands symbolically as perhaps the greatest single agent in increasing the value of the individual. This has made democratic government possible. It is also true that Luther earned for the Protestant churches the privilege of congregational singing that they now take for granted. Yet Luther's lasting legacy of sola scriptura, sola fide, so la gracia is best recalled in his own words. Scripture alone must be regarded as the infallible guide into all truth concerning Christian faith and life, and not reason, including my own. 
not church fathers, not church councils, or even the popes. Christ, the sinless Son of God, died in the place of man. He was made a curse for man, bore man's punishment and guilt. Christ's righteousness is imputed, given as free gift to the believer. Without works and only through faith, we are made holy, safe, and secure, so that we shall not be condemned, not because of our own holiness or purity, but because of Christ, because through faith alone we do cleave to him as our mercy seat, sure that in him no wrath remains, but only love, pardon, and forgiveness. Still our ancient foe doth seek to 